Hello and welcome everyone. Hope you're having an awesome day so far and an awesome week. We Today we are joined by Nick Rucker who has such an amazing story of how he's been able to climb and really go and uh, face some challenges on his journey. But he's here today to really show us how he's able to navigate those challenges and grow a portfolio of 19 units in four years. Without further ado, hey Nick, how, how are you hey, doing today? Good, how are you? I'm doing awesome. So Nick, you obviously have tons of experience with many different strategies and, and a pretty impressive portfolio so far. But to, to kind of take a step back, I was wondering if you could just touch on what kind of got you interested in real estate investing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the seed for me really, if I, like, if I really drill down, the seed for me was planted even back as early as, as elementary school. Um, we moved out of our house, the first house that I had as a kid, um, like back in the late eighties and we had our, our house built our, our the next house we moved into, we had it built. And in the meantime, we had to stay in this, this duplex in the little town that we grew up in, in Newburgh, Oregon. And it smelled funny and it was weird. And, and actually my sister, my little sister called it the museum. Um, cause it, cause of how it smelled. And, um, but I remember meeting that landlord. I remember meeting him. And he took us to Arctic Circle because he owned the restaurant, Arctic Circle, and he owned a number of different places in town, uh, properties in town. And he showed us all of the properties. And my parents picked this museum because it was the only property, really the reason it was the only property that was first floor. Like we didn't have to move our furniture upstairs. And uh, so we picked the smelly place to stay in while our house was being built. And um, But I just remember thinking, wow, this guy, what makes him so different? Like, why is he able to write his own ticket? Why does he own all these places? I thought the government owned all. I don't know. I thought maybe I was growing up in a communist America. I don't know what it, I, I didn't as a kid. I didn't have any idea how, how the world worked. So, you know, it was like, why does this guy own all these houses? But we only own one and those people don't own any and they might own theirs. I don't know. I don't know. I just understand how it worked. So that planted a seed. Nothing really happened with that for a long time, uh, even that must it probably took 20 years before um, I really acted on, and actually it was even longer than that. We bought our house, our first primary house in 2007. My wife and I had, were, were travel nurses uh, after we got married for a while, well well before COVID, uh, 2005. We got married and traveled for a couple of years as nurses, saved up a bunch of money. And, and we, uh, yeah, we bought our house here up in Everett, Washington. And... That was great, except we bought a house in 2007, which was not great because, you know, that house, I mean, to give you a sense of the numbers, it's every investor's worst nightmare. It's every home purchaser's worst nightmare. You buy a house and it's worth 40% less. Our house, we bought ours for 340 and by probably the bottom of, you know, 2000-ish, 10-ish, whatever it was, 11, it was worth maybe 200, 225 on paper. I mean, it's not like someone had come up and lopped off a third of my house, you know, uh, and we had good secure nurse jobs. So we weren't at risk of foreclosure. But I mean, we certainly felt what it's like to walk in those shoes. Like, wow, we're underwater on our mortgage. This is this homeownership is not what they cracked, what it's cracked up to be. And somehow, I'm not sure really how my wife and I um, had the had the mental we were able to, you know, we were just had the mental fortitude, I guess, to just like keep on making our monthly payments. I mean, what else are you going to do? You're going to declare bankruptcy and start over on your own. Um, we didn't do that. We just keep making our payments. And like, I guess we hope the market goes back up. Um, but then around 2012, our family starts outgrowing that house and that neighborhood took a whack. Like it really did not tolerate the economic downturn very well. Um, a ton of the properties were vacant so they were all dilapidated and a lot of people that moved in just didn't have the pride of ownership uh, and then a lot of people were investors that were having renters and they don't have the pride of ownership either um so yeah it, we just we wanted to get out of that neighborhood so our kids had some more space and we wanted to um just have a have a different quality of living and yeah the only way to do that was for me to work over time i was working on call and full time um, doing heart attacks at Virginia Mason, uh, actually putting stints in the heart alongside the cardiologist. There was a lot of opportunity for being on call and working overtime. And that's exactly what I did. And we saved up, we really just saved up enough for 10% down 
on a house that was in a price point. And we waited for a year until we actually found that house. We had two realtors looking out for us very carefully. And long story short, we bought this house and we fell into accidental landlordship um, because I wanted to try it because of our landlord as a kid. I wanted to give it a shot and see what it was all about. And you know, the math in my head was as simple as, well, my mortgage is 1800 and it looks like on Craigslist, I can get 1850 for it. Probably a good idea. That's really, that's about, that's the beginning and end of it. There was no more math to that. So, so, you know, I think I'm making a killing, uh, $50 of cash flow a month without considering property management, which I did manage it myself. Um, we didn't have any earmarks of any kind for vacancies. We didn't have any earmarks for CapEx or, or any of the things that we're taught to do now, um, that we've always been taught to do that I wasn't aware of. And you know what? I got lucky and it worked. It, it just did. I got the tenants I picked out, uh, whether it was a sheer stroke of luck or whether I just have like good intuition. My wife has good intuition. We picked out good tenants. They stayed with us for five years and I never raised rent on them because I'm, I'm a very passive person. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not the type. I need a property manager to raise rent most of the time. Um, so I'm, I've grown out of that a little bit, but, um, but yeah, that's my natural tendencies. So there we go. Yeah. I mean, I think kind of laying that foundation and that root, as you said, or that uh, little key of knowledge at the start there, especially if you were young, you didn't even understand real estate, but at least you had that kind of in the back of your mind. And I can re relate to that. I mean, I'm only 23. I mean, I, I haven't had as much experience as a lot of these people, but really laying that foundation early for me, it was like okay. when I was like, 13, 14, like people were looking up music videos, but I was looking up ways to make money and find <laughs> ways to kind of just generate this passive income. So even from an early age with me, I mean, I kind of have those same tendencies as well. Like I just want to get out there and take that action. And that's definitely what you did. Um, so I would love to dive into that first deal a little bit. So you said it was your primary residence. Um, mm -hmm. And then with kind of your knowledge, you didn't really mark it up right for the rents for, for that area. So you're only making about 50 bucks a month. Is that right? It was it was a proper it was, you know, that the cap rate was on point. Um, I, I do think I got fair market rent. I just never increased the rent, which is a, exactly. a mistake. And then the cash flow is horrible, you know, but it's what I had to do if I wanted to do what we were going to do changing houses without selling my house underwater, we had to, we had to rent out our primary house at about a break even, and then cross our fingers that appreciation would win the day. And it did. It took until 2018, actually around 2017, I thought the market was peaking. I was like, oh, it's 2017 and the market's getting pretty, pretty hot. I'm going to have to figure out what to do with this house. And so I sold it in 2018. And um, I sold it in 2018 and that's kind of actually, I should just rewind because I missed a big part in 2000, it was really in 2000, early 2017 that I started working with Jennifer Beatles and agents invest before the inner circle existed before a lot of what we actually think of as uh, agents invest even was a thing. Now um, we would meet at caliber and do meetups and get to know each other and have the occasional we, like this, none of this stuff happened back then really, or hardly any of it. Um, it was all email and, and Jennifer doing her, her blogs and her videos and stuff like that. And it was very informative and obviously bigger pockets was certainly an element. I read rich dad, poor dad. And that's when I decided in doing my 1031 research after reading rich dad, poor dad, that I wasn't going to pocket this money on the house. Like, my family was doing fine. We were making ends meet and more, and we didn't need the windfall from the house had at this point had gone up in value by quite a bit, um, which is why I thought the market had peaked. So the swings here are incredible. Um, you know, for the house to start at 236, where we bought it in 2007, to go to about 200 in 2011, and for me to sell it at four. 20 something wow you know, a, a, after putting down payment down and some some of the equity pay down we had about one hundred and sixty seven thousand dollar boot to put into 1031 and i was going to pay tax on it i was going to pay you know thirty six thousand dollars in tax on that because i'd been renting it out and the irs was going to take a bite and i didn't want to lose that money so that was another incentive for me to start investing like if i actually i actually would have paid money out of pocket if i didn't start investing 
True. Um, so that was an additional push that I needed to get going, uh, which sometimes it's hard. Like everyone always perceives downside when they take the risk. I guess for better, or for worse, I perceive downside even if I didn't take risk. And that's kind of where the 1031 thing nudged me in one direction. Um, but I spent all of 2017 and the bulk of 2018 reading and preparing and interviewing people and doing analysis. I would do analysis on properties all the time before I was ready to buy mm -hmm. and just practicing, just practicing, reading strategies. What's hard money? What What is all this stuff, you know? And by the time I sold that house, I had networked. I went out to Oklahoma City, met some people out there. I had a property under contract with a 16 unit apartment. I was going to go from renting out my primary house badly to try Which to manage. 1030, and then 1031, right? Yep. Yeah. So yep. exactly. It was the first time I'd sold a house. It was the first time I had bought out of state. It was the first time I had bought commercial. At that point, that's all there was. It was new. Just those things, right? That's all. Just those <laughs> Just, things. Yeah. Um, I get to the house, I get to the property out in o Oklahoma and I realize that either the performance is not what it says it is, or I just don't know how to visualize things because it was a nightmare and it was too much for me. And I couldn't, I couldn't take it. I backed out of that deal and the agents there uh, were ve are very investor savvy agents. And they said, Hey, listen, I know this is what you're looking for. I had five more days to identify with the IRS, what I was going to buy or pay tax. So, I, they said, this isn't your apartment, but it's a good class A property. It's a good class A deal. It'll get you into something that'll cash flow. And, and I was like, that, okay, let's, let's go ahead. I, I wrote the address on my form for the IRS and crossed my fingers that it would go through and I get the contract. And, but it wasn't enough. Like I, I actually had to have more leverage because of the property values being the way they are the Pacific Northwest versus the Midwest. I still didn't have enough purchase to avoid all my taxes. So I had to do a two for one exchange or a one for two exchange. I bought another property in Lakewood, Washington. It had graffiti on it, it had a dead animal inside. It had the doors on the hinges, windows were broken, smelled every bit of it. <laughs> and, and it was a nightmare and it was, it was on market, but obviously no one is picking it off. And the seller was pretty adamant about getting a price. And um, my agent here, mentored me through it and gave me the pushes that I needed to buy something that ugly and that horrible. And he also planted the seed of the adult family home. He helped me write up their pro formas for it. We talked, we, we interviewed contractors, we interviewed adult family home operators, and he helped me put that deal together. Um, it was pretty new for him also. I think he'd only had done it with one other person and that hadn't gone on for very long. I don't even think he had a year on that other deal. Um, but he's, he's like, this is the thing that people are doing. Like syndications now is the thing that everyone's doing, right? So this was the thing back then that people were kind of kicking the tires on. And I did that. So, but yeah, it was, it was a lot. I, I, if I hadn't prepared, if I didn't have resources like Bigger Pockets and resources like Jennifer and Agents Invest and Cody and, and even Travis, if I didn't have, I don't even think Travis remembers talking to me. I think he, we talked one time at a meetup and there, he said he said a couple of things to me. Uh, just kind of offhand from a contractor's point of view that just like pulled blind, like just my eyes were like, oh, I understand now. I don't need to be afraid of this uncertainty anymore. And so it's just amazing. I went from I went from doing one house at $50 cash flow that wasn't even real to selling my first house, doing my first 1031 exchange, buying my first property sight unseen out of state buying a second property at the same time, doing a hard money loan, doing a flip, flipping to an adult family home. All of those strategies combined were first. Wow. They were the wow. first time I've done any of it. And I did them all, all at once. And the only way I was able to do any of that, you're gonna think it's because of agents invest and all that, and it is, but it was really my wife. Um, having, having my wife, having my partner, helping me through it, uh, keeping me off, like from jumping off the cliffs when little things went wrong and things went very wrong, um, especially in, in Lakewood. But um, yeah, if, if she wasn't there to like keep me grounded, like even as simple as like, let's just go over the numbers. Let's look at our salary. Can we float this? Do we have enough reserves? You've budgeted for this. You've done the math. Like I just, I was locked into a line of thinking where this 
flip this adult family home is going to take three months because that's what I was told by my experts. And then it didn't uh, because they're not fortune tellers. They don't have a crystal ball. And um, yeah, that I, I expected to carry that hard money loan with Rain City Capital for three months. And I carried that loan for 361 days until it was paid off. And I had extensions lined up with them mm. no longer in case the closing fell through for some reason because stuff fell through all the time on that deal. Um, I was ready to wholesale that deal off. Like really? I was really ready to become the statistic of like, how do people get into such a horrible situation where they have to meet, go to a wholesaler? That was almost me. Like I can totally relate to that. And um, so, yeah, it's just, it's a mental game. It's, it's, it's all up here. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not like anyone's watching this thing. It's not like, well, he's had, he's had so much luck along the way. And there is a little bit of that, but at the same time, like we've seen, we've seen six figure swings that we've had to, you know, withstand. And I've had, you know, the adult family home, the carrying costs on that extra loan, were enormous the extra renovation costs on that were five figures you know in a budget that was also five figures it was you know it was a fifty thousand dollar budget that probably went close to closer to 70 plus carrying costs so you know that's 85 ,000, 90 000 over the course of a year um and yeah it's not easy like if it was easy no. that, that's what yeah. they said we're easy yeah. doing it and <laughs> it's not easy and exactly. so, yeah, there's always, yeah. There's always, I hardships. love, yeah, always hardships through, through it all, but it's really kind of laying out that network and people that you can go to who have experience and are, are able to guide you, which is the most important part. And I love how you brought up back in 2017, we didn't even really have this and you're so right. We, we didn't, but since then we've grown exponentially with mm -hmm. the investors we've had in our community and the results have seen that same growth path as well. Um, and that and that's what it's all about is kind of having that community mindset, being able to network and really understand these different strategies like a 1031, that family home that you had um, and even out of state investing, kind of those fun, those yeah. fundamental principles that that go into it. So we had uh, your primary residence that you sold off or technically 1031 into uh, a duplex as well as a um, adult family home in Washington there. Um, the duplex was in Oklahoma. But what, what, what happened after that? How did you know that you wanted to keep scaling and growing? Was there any other paths that you took along that yeah. journey? Well, 2019 was miserable, first of all, because I expected to cash out refi. I expected to burr out that adult family home and have a monster rent check coming in every month by around February or March of 2019. That didn't materialize really until the very, very end of 2019 or really effectively in, in January of 2020. Um, I think my years are right on that. It all goes by so fast. Um, anyway, you get the idea. Like 2019 was a slog because, you know, we got we got hit by the permits uh, with the city in Lakewood. I actually remember talking to Jen on the phone for 45 minutes about it. And she was so like understanding and so like calming, like, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Just help, help kind of helping me center. And, and Stacy, my wife, also is very instrumental in just helping me stay calm and, and stay centered. But it took, you know, a long time to get permits and get it all back on point. And then when it finally was, I was on a hike. My wife and I were hiking um, in Issaquah on Poo Poo Point. We were hiking up to Poo Poo Point. And I got the call from Cody that the house had appraised for 460000 which was a burr plus, uh, it was a burr plus maybe close to $20,000. Now, of wow. course, a year had gone by, right? So there's some market appreciation to help with that. Um, and we, you know, we actually decided, I don't know why, if I had to do it over again, I would. I think, I think I was just interested in making the bleeding stop, you know? And I wanted lower monthly payments. I think that's where my headspace was at. I was I was in pain. I wanted the bleeding to stop, and I wanted my cash flow to kick in. And so we actually didn't we didn't take the full burr on it. We left some extra equity on the table, and I took I took the cash flow over the burr. There we go. So we, so we got out of the hard money loan, and and yeah, um, and that November was that Thanksgiving was very relieving, you know. And then a few months go by. 
or even even close to another year goes by and I'm realizing, you know what? Like I actually had a bird, like I had it. And I kind of took a punt. I, I took a punt on it. And I'm going back and I'm looking at equity and I'm like, well, I mean, the money is still in there and now there's more. So I, I, I cashed it out again. Uh, and this time I took 96,000 out of it. Okay. And what'd you do with that? That was my aha moment. There we go. That was my aha moment. It was like, wow, I just bought this house for free. Like I bought this house with equity from my primary house and money that I put down in 2007, you know, like I, I don't that I haven't paid much of any money for this at all. Like all, all of my rehab money came from Rain City, um, Rain, Rain City, you know, the uh, hard money guys. And yeah, it was like th this, this has legs. Like I, I haven't really put a lot of my own money into this. So I bought a 13 unit apartment and we bought properties in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And yeah, we just kind of keep on rolling it forward. Um, the, 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 the property in Pasco, the 13 unit in Pasco, I have a partner on, didn't have to have a partner on, but I'm learning that, um, partners help me stay. They just help me. I don't know. I, I'm, I like, I like having people. Um, I like yeah. having teams. Um, I like the social aspect of it. So I could have done the Pasco deal all, all on my own. Like we had the liquidity to do it. But um, my partner is, he's been a property manager basically his whole life and done some investing on the side as well. And we'd been trying to get a deal together for five years and it never really landed. And this time it did. And it was like, yeah, let's, we got to do this. This is the time to do it. So, so we did that. And that was basically a 1% rule deal in Pasco, Washington. You can't get a 1% rule in Pasco, Washington anymore. And on top of that, our rents have gone up about 30 30 to 40 percent wow so we are we are planning to burn that out this year great i love it you're just using either the equity you have or at the start others other Same. people's money to get it in here and just keep growing and scaling and that's what i love about specifically the burn method but there's plenty of other strategies yeah. it is the um, same recycled money over and yeah over. yeah okay so now we've kind of outlined your portfolio right now um, but I kind of want to take a little bit of a step back and through this entire process, I'm sure you had kind of a bunch of fears, um, uh, but what fears specifically did you have maybe for out of state investing and, uh, how did you overcome that? And is there any advice that you would give new investors also trying to get on this same trajectory? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I was telling, I was telling you privately in emails that we've had over the last month or the last few weeks, anyway, the, the screenshot I picked with me summoning Mount Rainier is really symbolic for me. Um, I tried summoning Mount Rainier about 10 years ago and I failed miserably. And it wasn't the weather. It wasn't, I didn't have just some kind of bad window where the, the snow was unstable or avalanche danger or any of that. Like I just was not ready to do it. And I wasn't physically ready to do it. I wasn't mentally ready to do it. Uh, and I didn't have the knowledge to do it. And I came back off that mountain feeling kind of and this was 10 years ago, I came back off the mountain feeling kind of like re dejected, demoralized, like, oh man, that's harder than I thought it was going to be. Maybe I don't have what it takes. And I kind of held on to that for a long, like since then I've held on to that. And um, in the interval of time, we got into this investing stuff and I realized, you know, with, with the right support and with the right knowledge and with the right teams, you can do things that you're not able to do. You can look down you know, the face of a really nasty renovation that's not going on schedule and the city that's slapping you with permits, with fines and uh, that you didn't intend, like they treat you like a criminal and you're like, I'm not a bad person. I really am not. And you're almost having like, you know, it's not just, it's not just that you, your investment has been taken a whack. It's like, you're feeling personally insulted and attacked. Your character is being attacked when the city does this to you. Um, it was just an accident. Like, I'm not a big wig investor. I'm a nurse that's trying this out. Like, don't you guys see the difference? Um, and anyway, yeah, um, climbing that mountain for the second time was a completely different experience because I, I had the right team. Um, I didn't necessarily pay guides, but I had the right people to help me go up. And I had the right equipment and I had the knowledge of how to use it, which is also very important. It's not just enough to have 
you know, a Burr calculator. Um, and, 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 then I, and then I had the mental will to do it and train to do it ahead of time. And when I got to the top of that mountain, I felt like a million bucks in every way. And that's, it's very much the same. It's all, it's almost all of it's up here in your head. Like, can you do it? How, how bad do you want it? And can you take the steps to get there one step at a time? Um, with the properties, it's just, yeah, it's just about, it's what Agent Invest offers wholesale. They just, they just serve it upon a platter. Here's your team, <laughs> here's your resources, here's your networking which is what makes it so valuable um, because otherwise you're going to have to piecemeal all this stuff together. I mean, on your own and you don't know who you're going to trust and you don't know. And it's not, it doesn't have to you, you, people are people and there's still going to be pitfalls along the way. You're not always going to get the best referral. Like there's no one that can mitigate that to zero. And if that's what you think you're paying for, maybe reframe that in your head a little bit because <laughs> it's just not feasible for anybody to be able to offer that. Um, but at the same time, it is as it's as close to um, it's as close to a team on a plate on a platter as you're gonna ever be able to come across. And so, yeah, it's a really great resource to have. And I'm not sure if I answered your question. I kind of got off track. <laughs> I think you did. I think I think you did awesome. And really, that's what our entire community in the ROI Inner Circle is all about: is really providing the tools, resources, knowledge, and know-how to do all of this and really present it for people to use and take action on. That's what we love to see. Uh, we had some incredible results last year and we're expecting even greater here in 2022. So Nick, we've kind of gone through your story, your, your portfolio from start to finish here, but I know you're not finished yet, um, but what are some things that you're working on now or what are some of your plans for the future? Yeah, so at, at now at this very moment, I am actively refining, not refining, HELOCing this house again. The last time I HELOCed it, the value wasn't such that I could get the maximum amount at my lending place. So um, it's a couple of years have passed, equity has gone up. I'm pretty sure I can max out my HELOC here. So that's the first thing I'm doing, already been doing it, it's in the works. Um, second thing I'm doing is the contract on the duplexes in Memphis. Uh, I just got those assigned over to Janelle Snow and actually it was really Janelle that did it. Uh, Janelle and I are in a mastermind together and uh, we, uh, we've had deals under contract before and they didn't work out, which is actually really nice. I, I, I'll, I'll say a really quick sidebar. If you're ever looking to do a deal with anybody in the circle uh, and it doesn't work out, that's okay. That's actually probably a good thing. That means you're, that means you're doing your due diligence and you're not, you're not making a deal for the sake of making a deal, you know, like you're not forcing it. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, yeah, Janelle Snow and Jason, her husband, and Stacy and I have had properties in a contract before that work, didn't work out. And so now we're working on this duplex deal in Memphis, Tennessee. And that looks like it's really going to land on its feet nicely. So we're, we're working that. My goal for the year was originally to stabilize what I have, the Pasco apartments, get those rents up, get those units turned, appliances, all that, um, the stuff in Milwaukee that's going on. I had a, other, other hardships. I had a burr bust last month, you know, mm -hmm. burr bust. I don't know if anyone has ever called it a burr bust or not, but it's when you plan, to do, I've heard it. you plan to do a burr and it lands flat on its face. Like, oh, I put more into that than I got the appraisal for. Well, that's a drag. So, uh, and in this case, it's not a lot more. It's like a thousand. I put 81,000 or something like that into a deal that is came back with an appraisal of 80. And I think the appraisal is, is garbage also, which only makes it that much more frustrating. But, um, Anyway, so that, yeah, you know, it's, awesome. there's always, there's always things to overcome, right? Yeah. Um, so, so what was I saying? Um, that's where we're at now. I got to figure out this burr bust. I got to do the duplex. I'm going to do the duplex with Janelle and get those turned and stabilized and cash flowing amazingly well. We'll probably end up selling one of those off to finance, to finance the others. So when you see that come through on the deal blast, don't run away from it. It's not a bad deal. We just need the liquidity to uh, <laughs> to fix the other five. I love um, it. And then, and then, yeah, uh, stabilize awesome. what we have and keep rolling forward. 
Awesome. One last question here for you, Nick. I'd love to ask each and every person that comes on these Facebook lives with me, but what is your why? Why did you get interested in real estate? Why are you putting in all this work to create this passive income uh, for you? A mm -hmm. couple of reasons. Um, family time being one of them. I want to have that family time. I have to be mindful of not sacrificing the time that I actually do have right now. Because I do have, I have afforded myself a fair amount of time to, to spend with the family. And I want to make sure that I don't get so distracted chasing the golden property that I am actually sacrificing the very thing that I'm doing it for. Um, but yeah, family time is huge. Uh, the opportunity to travel with the family is huge. Really though, you know, I've wanted to do overseas mission work, uh, health care style mission work for uh, a long time um, back in back in 98 when I was in high school 97 whatever it was I went down to Honduras with a nurse practitioner and a team of of other nurses we didn't have any physician there with us there was Honduran physicians in country that we worked with but we didn't bring any and we did a bunch of stuff out in the jungle we did surgical stuff we did all kinds of stuff out in the jungle stuff you'd never be allowed to do here in the U.S. and we really made a good impact out there and that planted another seed for me um, I became a nurse uh, thinking I'd be a nurse practitioner and then didn't really want to go back to school, didn't want to miss time with the family. And so I just stayed working as a nurse. And But I, I've continued to, to travel and do some mission work abroad when I can justify getting away from the family. It's a kind of a, you know, catch. It's a, it's a catch-22 between like being selfish with my time and taking off and leaving my family and my wife to fend for themselves here and and uh but also wanting to you know kind of do my service stuff i'm actually going to be going to south africa next month as well Oh, how fun um, so yes so that'll be a, a good opportunity to see see how that country works it's kind of a a survey trip i'm looking for places basically to conceivably you know not really re maybe re kind of retire but to start to start or augment an existing program uh awesome. in, in my retirement and Great. the best ways I can see to do that is through cash flowing rentals that free me up to be present um, and have a constant revenue generating stream of money to kind of put into those put into those services. And so I want to do that, want to do that for a long time. Awesome. Well, Nick, you have a truly incredible story from start to finish, and I cannot wait to see what the future holds for you and your portfolio. Um, if anyone does have any questions about Nick's journey, feel free to put them in the chat here. Um, I'll try my best to go through. I'm sure Nick can hop in and answer any questions you guys have as well. Uh, but Nick, it has been a true honor and pleasure to have you on here today with us to share your story. Uh, we just want to say thank you so much and uh, hope you have an awesome rest of your day. All right. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. You too. Thanks. Take care. Bye.